first of all, hi everybody. My name is Micheline Amar. I am a PIT consultant from L'Equipe Shock Pedagogical. But today I'm here uh, with the hat of a mom and a teacher because I, I, this, this subject specifically is, uh, is very dear to my heart. I have a son who is diagnosed with dysphagia. So this is a beautiful, I'm humbly thankful for Karine and Karine to give me this, this chance to, to create awareness about it. So um, let's start. Yeah, I have a few words for you. So I want to thank you so much to be in there today to participate to this workshop with Micheline. So dysphagia is a learning disability to have ex mini adults in training. We must understand how we, it's, it's being manifested and find solutions together. So for people who don't know me, I'm Karine Jacques, orthopedagogue, and I work with the AGA and VT centers. And it's for me, it's a pleasure to be here today for you and for the students. So Micheline, I'm going to present a workshop on dysphagia. You can ask questions at the end, and the, present, the presentation is recorded and will be available in a few days. We also give you an infographic that summarizes today's presentation. I really hope you will have fun and learn, no matter who you are. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So let's start with the, um, well, with the vocabulary. Like the word dys dysphagia did not exist uh, prior to 1960 because it's, it's, it's what is dysphagia really? Back then it's, it's not a, it, it wasn't even in the horizon that there exists some uh, language disorder. Everything fell under other mental, um, like uh, other issues. So, um, so dysphagia is relatively new disorders that's approximately six years old. And in research terms, 60 years old is like a relatively young um, a term. Um, other terms that we call dysphagia uh, with is uh, autoimmunity, which is, uh, which is connected, if you notice, with audio. So anything that dealt with sound, so they, 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 they gave it a term. So it's an old term that referred to dysphagia. And also back then, um, dysphagia, dysphagia um, was under the umbrella of autism, since autism uh, um, dealt with the difficulty of communication and social relations. So it fell under that umbrella. It's only till like between 1980s and 2004 that the, the term dysphagia was really was given a clinically, uh, the clinical term dysphagia was actually starting to be used. And since then, dysphagia is a term that is super popular and people are more um, interested uh, and it's still used even with the more refined studies and research. Notice uh, around the 2004 to 2017, researchers just took interest into that field and did, and did lots and lots of studies and research and certain more technical terms you start seeing show up, like primary language disorders. And of course, with more time and more research, more precise terms and characteristic and better definition came along. And that's where we got developmental language disorder, TLDs. But even with all of that research, uh, the term dysphagia is still very used nowadays. Now, what is it really? It's a disorder's neurological origin, all right? It affects different degrees, the receptive and expressive language processing systems. It's from the hearing of words to the speaking of the words. Now you may say, well, what's the difference between difficulty and a disorder? The, the difference between difficulty and disorder is difficulty with the right tool, the right, pro, uh, the right, um, Process, uh, the right tool, the right support, it will disappear versus the disorders, no matter what, with the right tools, with the right support, it's there for the rest of your life. You live with it. Uh, this disorders exist from birth and it persists through life. And of course, uh, one major, major issue with this, this disorder is causing the individual to experience difficulty in carrying out social 
or learning activity normally expected at this age, at their age. So most of the time, they, they seem to be younger than where they're, what they're supposed to. They behave younger, they process things younger than they're supposed to. But what it's not, it's not a hearing deficit. And most of the kids, like my son, for example, when, when he was diagnosed, the first thing, the first part of the process is to get his hearing checked. It's because it's not a hearing problem. The, 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 the organs are functional, right? Uh, and it's not a malformation of the, the organs of speech. And it's not an intellectual disability. And it's not acquired after a brain injury. Um, and it's not part of the autism spectrum disorder, and it's not due to lack of stimulation. Um, what causes what causes uh, what causes this disorder? It's still vague. There's no there's not a hundred percent consensus on the causes of of dysphagia, but a lot of research points towards simply an abnormal brain uh, electrical activity dysfunction. Um, it's a dysfunction of the structure located on the left hemisphere of the brain. Uh, it is also uh, due to genetic uh, factors. So if you have a dysphagic person in your family, the chances that anyone later on, any child in that family specifically will have it is two in seven kids. And it touches the boys more than the girls. Why? We don't know. Um, usually, uh, people with dysphagia, uh, they hear very, very well. It's not a hearing issue. Their perception, uh, the person may mix sounds and words that look the same, like the word tree and three. To them, it just sounds the same. They look the same. So that's one of the difficulties. In terms of understanding, <clears throat> the person may have difficulty grasping the subtleties of the language. Like when we say to mo uh, Monday, to him Monday could be tomorrow, Tuesday could be tomorrow. So they have difficulty with time. And um, inferences also, uh, words that have many meanings. Uh, and expressions also, for example, when you say I love you to the moon and back to them, it's like, it's literal. They don't know the, 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 what they mean, right, in between, unless you explicitly go through the explanations. Um, in terms what links, uh, the link between languages, um, notice that the person must reach her through his knowledge to find the word that correspond to the, uh, to the concept he wishes to express. So for example, um, like when you're thinking about red truck, hose, fire, ladder, I know what it is, but I can't find those words. This is the issue. Most of the time is the, the terminology. Okay. What we call evocation lexical. Um, in terms of organization, Mrs. organization, you'll notice that the person may have less understandable speech because they have a harder time knowing what to start with, like where do you start? Like you have the information all in your head, but it just doesn't come out the way you want it to say it. So have difficulty knowing where do I start uh, to express what I want to say. And, and especially when they get excited, that's even worse, then it becomes even more difficult for them to, to express what they want. So, okay. So uh, it's, it's difficult. It has nothing to do with intelligence. They're super, super smart. They're super intelligent. Uh, it has to do with, the, and they know what they want to say. It's just, they don't know how to say it. In terms of phonological programming, the person may have difficulty organizing words. So again, planification, organization in terms of sounds, in terms of words, in term. Um, this is very interesting because this is the part where actually the, their brain uh, kind of plays tricks on them in terms of adding and versing, removing sound in words. So it's extremely frustrating for them. They're trying so hard to communicate 
and 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 it's not coming out the way they want to say it and they know what they want to say so sometimes they may lose patience sometimes when when people they don't understand even though they're trying super super hard to explain they, they just shut down they shut down it's because they, they they're always in that posture is like can you repeat please can you repeat please and they're really really trying to say it it's just it comes out sometimes it comes out sometimes it comes out most of the time wrong So in terms of, term of production, although they want to communicate, the person may have difficulty executing the sequence of sound to produce their message. They may have pronunciation difficulty. This is on top of it. Like you may notice sometimes they have the, the muscles of their mouth and the way their tongue is positioned is not executing the sounds properly. So that's why sometimes like the sound like the, they mean it may not come out the way it's supposed to. Make. I was like, Dah. because it's just their muscles, their their facial muscles, and the, the position of their tongue is, is not collaborating with what they're supposed to be doing, right? So it's um it's it's very very frustrating. And also just think about uh the the student that if I come and I ask the student and I don't understand as a student, I may not want to come back and ask the same student if it takes a lot of effort on my side to, to try to understand that student, this physics student. So by you start, I, the, as a student, they start being isolated. So they're disadvantaged already by not being able to, to communicate is isolating them, even though they want to connect. Yeah. So now in terms of research, there was a little research that was done over 36 youth at University of Quebec at Trois-Rivières, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and these were, were, these were statistics that were, they were uh, been uh, collected. 50% of the students, the dysphagic students don't understand their own disorder. So 60%. 63% they can't explain it to others. So if they don't understand it, it's very difficult to explain to others to be your own advocate, right? So based on all these statistics, also 76% show that um, they have lots of low self-esteem, right? Um, and they live with a lot of frustration, so anxiety, and that triggers anxiety. And they're targeted students. They're mostly bullied. There's a lot of them, these, these students, they're, they're target, they're, they're bullied. And 55% um, have difficulties in making friends, so in relationships. And 32% 32, 32 have a hard time keeping friends. So it's a very, very difficult disorder to live with, especially when they want, they have the desire to, 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 to connect to others. They want to have friends. They want to live with others. It's just, it, it, their disorder makes it very, very difficult to connect to others. Okay. So that in terms of impact on their personal lives, and uh, on their daily routine, it could start off from simply from personal care, like in terms of hygiene, health, like even having communication with doctors, like explaining how they feel in terms of just going to buy products, like just communicating with anyone, transport, travels, um, housekeeping, like just simple, simple action of going to buy groceries and actually asking for specific ingredient, for example. And it's uh, the hardest one I've, like I find in my case, in my son's case, of course, is the socio-emotional life. They want to have relationship with friends. They want to have girlfriends. They want to have a love life, right? So um, it, it's, it's very, it takes a toll on them because they don't, they, they're really, really trying. And, um, and sometimes it's very, very difficult to, to reach the other side. So this is the hard part is even with help, um, there's always some support that that is required. On the good, on a good note, with that, uh, with with the right support, um, with early support from parents and professionals and teachers, usually language that look positively in in adolescents and young adults. So so, you could, we could like kind of empower them. Now 
other other areas of impact, which is outside of school life, like terms of adults, uh, you're talking about management of a budget, money, uh, invoice, taxes, rent, uh, integration of studies, work, uh, leisure, residential autonomy. Of course, we're not talking about a dysphasic person. There's a degree, there's a variety of that, the impact on them, right? So um, with, with all the support they need, sometimes they may need someone to come and talk to the landlord for them, right? They might need someone to, to uh, the, their employer to, to explain what kind of accommodation or, or, you know, they may need. Now, how do we help? This is the fun part that I find really, really interesting. Um, how do you support a dysphagic person? Uh, in a school context, in a work context, in a social context. Notice the, character, the characteristic of a dysphagic person. It's, it's, it's present all over these contexts, all right? And, and interestingly enough, you have the picture of an iceberg is what you see. Sometimes it's not necessarily what's really, really happening. That's why awareness is really, really important. Now, the, the next uh, the next section I divide uh, well I divided it we divided it in term of like what we see what we think and how can we help you'll see another another in the next slide so what do we see if you recognize these characteristics among your students or among your peers um, this is sometimes we have the tendency to think in those terms but we'll see what actually is really happening and how we could help. If let's say I had many students that did not listen, uh, they're in the moon, they play with their, their toy, like their pencils or stuff on their desk and they're easily distracted and you're like, come on, what's happening? You're not listening. So in my, like sometimes I was guilty at the beginning to think, oh, they have an attention pro uh, problem, lack of interest, lack of motivation. What's the issue here? Like, you know, I'm trying already to kind of do things that I'm not supposed to do, but it's like human nature. Sometimes we touch, we jump to, to, oh, we may think that. But actually what is happening is the person does not understand the information. Simple and sweet. So what can we do to help? Getting their attention using hand gesture, using picture pictograms, that helped me a lot for the younger ones, um, writing detailed instruction like list in chronological order, one step after the other, so to help them planning and organizing their thoughts or what to do, make short sentences with simple vocabulary, allow thinking time between sentences, and again, there's no science between the, to, to say it's five seconds, you should just do science, you know, counts five seconds. It's just their processing of the information is a bit, um, it's a bit, it takes longer for them. So just to think every time you're giving a direction, like someone like me who, who, who has a bit difficulty in waiting, I don't know the concept of waiting. So I force myself to count in my head, one, two, three, four, five, to give them, to allow them time to process the information, okay? And another trick which is super important is we have a tendency as like teachers or, or even as colleagues or as peers is to repeat the same information differently every time thinking, oh, he didn't understand it the first time. Let me try it again in a different, with different words. Let me try it again in a different form. The truth is it's, really essential to repeat the information with the same words over and over, not to give him new information to process. So this is super important. It's, it's really important to use the same exact word. We could repeat it, but use the same exact word because he had just the time or she had just the time to kind of digest the information. You're reinforcing the information that you gave the students. But if you change it every time, you're kind of creating more processing time. So. Now, what do we see? Another characteristic we may see, the person does not ask questions, does not ask for explanation, sits there and is always nodding their head, right? We may think, obviously, oh, they understand. Well, they, 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 or if they ignore us, the desire to succeed, they don't have any desire to, to succeed. There's no effort. 
They don't even try. The lack of organization, they're all over, you know? Actually, again, going back to the same point, the person does not know that they don't understand, okay? And they, and they want to hide their misunderstanding. They don't want to be the person always not understanding in a class, right? So what do we do? We have to reiterate the, the fact that to encourage, uh, to encourage patience, not patience, <laughs> patience and kindness with oneself and others, Okay, so to create a very um, a non-competitive, a safe environment where where it's okay to to be kind and to help each other, uh, to ask the person to rephrase what they understood in their own word. And please, this one I would really like you to highlight it. You cannot use it if there's no connection between you and the students. Okay, because what happened if you don't have a connection with that student? they will shut down. They will shut down. They will think like you think that they are not capable of thinking. They'll take it emotionally versus what you're trying to do is just to make it, you know, trying to clarify that they really understood, but make sure you have a strong connection with the students or with, with a peer if this is something you want to do. In, in one of my classes, for example, I turned this as, into a normal practice. I would teach something and I would say, okay, everyone in the class, take out your rephrasing booklet and write in a simple, like in a paragraph, what you understood today. So it became a common practice. I normalized that methodology and I picked up everybody's workbook and I corrected it. So it wasn't that one person, that two person, it's everyone. So it became, it's actually a good studying mechanisms anyways. Yeah. So, and of course, if that specific student come to you for help, that's huge. So please make an effort or, or make sure that they know that you do appreciate their request for help because it's very, very difficult for them to ask for help. Especially, again, think from a very young age, they're the kid who always been targeted. So for them to, to come to ask you for help, for help is because there's a there's a trust there is a comfort uh, and that should be really really appreciated and validated and valued and to make sure that this to 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 let know the students of that now we may see something another characteristic like that the person is not doing the job requested or is doing something else like i noticed like for example i'll give you an example of something like that my son i'll tell him like go pick up this for me something for me and he'll go somewhere else and pick up something completely different and i'm like what the hell you, know, you didn't listen and it's the lack of respect is it an attention is it a re refusal to cooperate at the beginning i had a hell of a time excuse me for that but it is like i see all of that in my beautiful young man now uh the the, the truth is i realized after is that he did not really understand the instruction and uh, he didn't know, based on all the information I was giving him, which one was the first thing I have to do, what was essential, what was a common, was too much, was an overload <laughs> of information. So what to do to help? I learned with time to give fewer instruction, to give, to give a number of tasks to do in a chronological order. So checklist, right? Uh, provide an example of what to expect like what to be expected at the end. Uh, because um, usually they, have, they cannot retain more than one or two information uh, simultaneously, two to three max. So imagine if you have like a, uh, an assignment that requires seven steps. They'll remember the first and the last and everything in between is hazy. So you will get something, but it's not what's to be expected. So that's why a uh, student with dysphagia requires a bit more direction, a bit more explicit directions. And of course, illustration being through imaging or through written instruction is the best because they have something to go back and over again and to actually um, rely on. And again, let's just emphasize this has nothing to do with intelligence. It's just the processing of the information. 
Another, another characteristic we may see is the person forgets the step of a task or does not respect the order. And again, we may think it's no, he has no memory, we may have lack of concentration, it's lack of listening, it's a lazy thing, you know? The truth is actually the person has difficulty remembering more than two or three simple verbal instructions. And it's the verbal part, the issue. Uh, what to do to help, memory aid, checklists, allow them time to organize their workspace. That's why a lot of these students have difficulty moving from one task to the other instantly. It's very, very important to allow time in between task change because it takes time for them to change register. Um, and, and, and to perform the task in the front of a person by explicitly naming the different parts or steps. This is a very, very uh, interesting method. It's, it's just to be very explicit. It's almost like letting them know what you're thinking every step of the way, okay? Transparency in, in, in our thoughts. So far, so good? Yeah, you're so good, Micheline, thank you. <laughs> I have a question. Please, please, so go ahead. <laughs> so if I come across students who are either undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, and so I, as you said, what I see, and I'm assuming ADHD, lack of motivation, if I talk to them, will, like, do they all have sort of the expressive verbal disorder well, where I'd be able to tell it more by hearing and go, oh, there's something there? Or do some of them express okay verbally, but taking all the information in? Well, th th this is, uh, again, this is from a teacher, mom, hat. This is not an expert in any way possible. Um, this basic students and ADHD and attention deficit and, yeah. and, and autism, they do have, they all fall under the umbrella of difficulties of some sort, right? So of course they all share a lot of the characteristics. So we should never just re rely on one or two characteristics we see. And we're not in a posture to diagnose either. It's more, it's more, okay, if I see a repetitive, a repetitive pattern of behavior, like for example, I give an assignment and he's always doing it wrong, then maybe I should, start investigating further. If I give him a checklist, does that work better? You know, it's, it's putting all these tools in place. It's regardless of what he's diagnosed or not diagnosed with. It's what, what tools can I put in place to help that specific student? And I think, I think what helps one helps everyone. But if specific student you have in mind that, that you're having difficulty kind of See, pinpointing where where is is difficulty maybe trying different tools uh might help and in terms of the expressive part expressive part i don't think the expressive part belongs to only dysphagia but it's a strong one but Karen, you may correct me you probably well, you're right know. you're right it's also you know when you have an overload of information yeah. when you have too much information at once because when we're when we're teaching, we don't we don't think of that because we're just giving information, right? But that specific student's receiving being being ADHD or being dysphagic or being whatever he has, right? It's so much information, but specifically to the dysphagic student, it's he has to his main issue is organization and planification of of, of information. So when you're getting so much bombarded and the I don't want to use the word they have a delay, but they do have a kind of processing delay because it's so much that's being processed at once. And, and it, it may come out as a lack of concentration. It may come out as, as, uh, as uh, overwhelmed. It may come out as a shutdown. I'm not interested because there's too much going on in my head, right? So, so it's just taking it back a step, slowing down, um, shorter... Um, how can I say, uh, shorter instruction, uh, giving like a breather moment between instruction. These are all will benefit one, benefit everyone. You know what I mean? 
it's it's I, I would look at it a bit differently. Like I would look at it, okay, regardless of what the student has, let me try this tool, let me try this tool, let me try this tool. And and having starting off with having a connection saying, I want to help. Can you let me know what works for you? And having that open conversation, not just with one, with everyone, but th so they don't feel targeted either because they're so sensitive I and mean, they're aware. They're super, super aware. They don't want to be standing out by themselves. So when it becomes a practice, it's appreciated. Does that answer? Uh, a little bit yeah. well, just sort of like I'm an autism mom so I I all those things the, the the concentration the checklist like I do all that but I'm just trying to think more as an educator if I have in a classroom someone who's sort of undiagnosed with dysphagia will it be more like because there's a lot of kids unmotivated and the concentration but auditorily will I be able to say oh maybe we should flag this child like with the, the verbal speech I guess that's where I was more looking yeah sort of okay at. well mo most of the time these kids not all of them not all of them but they, they have some sort of expressive issue yes mm -hmm. my, my son is a very very high functioning dysphagic uh he's like you'll know a, a mile away that the the, the, the pronunciation is not a hundred percent you do understand but it's, there's stuff that gets chewed, there's stuff that gets certain sounds will not come out the, the way they should. But he, dev, well, of course, he developed so many tricks to kind of, if you don't, like, he, he's so used to it now that can you repeat again, he's able to slow down and maybe take more time in, in, in saying his sentence, which before used to be really upset and anxious. He has full of anxiety because he's so worried that people don't understand him. But yes, the expressive part, the expressive part is, is an indicator. Like it could be a, not a, like not a definite indicator, but could be one of the characteristics that will kind of um, touch this basic students. Yes. May, may I explain something in, uh, in French and you're going to translate for me, uh, Micheline? Go, go ahead, Karine. <laughs> Denise, uh, qu'est-ce que tu as dit là? Les personnes qui ont un... TSA, un trouble du spectre de l'autisme et la dysphasie, longtemps ont été mêlés parce ouais. qu'ils ont les mêmes caractéristiques. Et ça ne fait pas beaucoup d'années qu'ils sont dissociés et qu'on voit que c'est un trouble qui n'est pas euh, du trouble autistique parce qu'ils veulent communiquer, parce qu'ils ils, ils peuvent, ils comprennent de la même façon qu'une personne neurotypique, qu'une personne qui est euh, neurotypique. Alors, ça fait pas beaucoup d'années, mais il y a beaucoup, beaucoup de caractéristiques qui sont reliées à l'autisme, effectivement, ce que vous dites. Oui, yeah. non, c'est correct, oui, oui, yeah. c'est beau. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So just to go over what Karine said for everybody else is uh, autism and dysphagia. Uh, um, interrelated. Assortment. Yeah, they're, they're super related and they're like intertwined. And it's only recently they were able to kind of separate them but they do have the same characteristics. So yeah. Just to, and so it's very, very difficult to, to separate one and the other, you know, to categorize. But at, from a teacher's perspective, it's irrelevant because they need the same tools. Being, being uh, on the autism spectrum or being this phasic student, like a student, they still need the same tool, the slowing down, the checklist, the... Yeah. The, yeah. Is and hopefully there... we'll... Is there written output? Do they have, is it easier for them to write than to process and speak? Like, is there written output more yes. regular? Yeah, uh, well, they use technology. That's where technology becomes mm -hmm. super useful because handwriting most of the time is not necessarily the best, but the, their thoughts are there. It's just, the mechanism of letting it out and organizing it. So they, they need to have more tools in, in, in place for that. Yeah, but in the production part, technology is a must for those yeah. students. Thank you. So another, another characteristics um, that you may see, the person does not start the work or, ta uh, or uh, takes a long time to do a task. How many we have in 
class sometimes that you see that one student, you have the sign in front of them, they're staring at it and they just don't know what to do. Well, sometimes you may think it's a lack of effort, lack of initiative, the lack of motivation. Uh, some teacher may feel like they always need me standing there for them to do their work. It's not that. It's just, again, they, they have difficulty anticipating and dividing tasks. They just cannot, uh, again, they have problem with, in, in, with the planification of a task, right? And in the execution of it, because in their head is they're overwhelmed. Like, what, where do I start? All I need is just where do I start? And, you know, so what to do to help is ask about how to go about it. So um, guiding them questions, guiding with questions, or again, a checklist or uh, referring to something they've done recently, or if they have an example. Um, again, another method is to concretely demonstrating how to do something, you know, okay, now look, step one, we do this, you know, like step two, step three, or another idea is to give the task ahead of time ahead of time so they have time to kind of debug and plan what they need to do because they do need the time to do that okay so when you talk and they have to write so it's two things to do it's difficult yeah it's really difficult so either either you provide already the written material and then you could talk, but they had to have the written material ahead of time so they could at least go through it and know. And probably when you say it again, just to reinforce it. So they need that. Okay. We have a question. Concern yes. right now, I love the tools that you're, you're giving us. And by the way, I think we have the same sun. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but, uh, Possible. <laughs> in, in an evaluation context. Oh. We can't give them ahead of time. We can't show them how to do it. We can't. So how do we help during evaluation? For the AGA or VT? I, I'm an adult. Yeah. It's a, it's a very, very challenging question because I did have this conversation in terms of like when we're looking at competency and different strategies to solve something. In, in their case, due to their issues, uh, we could give a memory aid if it's allowed, you know, like especially in math, where uh, they have to probably focus more on like one strategy and master it well. Mm -hmm. um, other things could be also they have access to a computer. So there is accommodation, they're allowed to accommodation for exams. So longer time, uh, a reader, a computer, they, they, they have, they, they're allowed to their accommodation. In terms in term how you prepare them, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the, the only thing you could do is, again, whatever you teach them, make, that, make sure that they know it very, very well. Uh, in terms, like, for example, I'm not saying solving, uh, showing a strategy and making sure that strategy could be applied in different setup mm -hmm. instead of showing different strategy for different resolution. So you just work the other way around, have one strategy, even if it's harder maybe to apply it in different areas, but to work that strategy in many areas. And I know, I know this because I teach math. And math is the hardest. Uh, I find it's not true. I shouldn't be no. biased. Okay, I shouldn't be saying it. <laughs> I'm biased because I'm a math teacher. It's the no, hardest. Like teacher. the the task part of the evaluations, the eighty yeah. percent part, they have to organize their thoughts themselves. Like the you you can't have a memory aid for those, <laughs> even if they understand the concepts very well. They'll they'll have to do the the hard thinking on their own, and I find that difficult for some of them. That's you know. You know, one thing I tried and it helped uh, is, uh, and I could, I could come back and I'll send it to you if you want. I have a checklist with, um, what I did is I took the, the uh, rubric with the competencies and what I did for every competencies, I turned it into questions. Do I have all my information? Do I have this? So almost like a checklist for them to have all the components that's required for every kind of um criteria to be evaluated on mm -hmm. and that 
will maximize their chances to at least have some of the components. It, it, it's it, unfortunately, we're looking at competencies, right? So are they able to be competent? Competency doesn't come over a day or two or a semester or two, right? It takes over time and a lot of repetition and, and sometimes to some takes longer, sometimes shorter. But if we kind of know how they work, like in terms of what they need, and we maximize it to their advantage. So I could send you what I what I have as a rubric. I, I, I always give it the first day of class and I use this rubric all the time from day I one. I have your rubric, but I don't think I've ever thought of putting it on a memory aid. Putting it on a memory aid in a question form because you cannot necessarily put it Put it as like okay identify all the relevant information to a students like okay what is the question like like try to you can even do the exercise with them and writing their own question do the exercise yeah. like okay let's take this task what would you ask yourself to recognize this information what to write so by including them maybe they have their own words that they could put on their 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 maybe memory aid so it triggers maybe how to go about solving. And sometimes it's the process that's being evaluated. So even if it's a question, they may not be able to answer, but they know what am I looking for? I may get some elements of it. Yeah. Another method, maybe uh, Karin, you made me remember Martin mentioned, you could also maybe, let's say if you do a math, uh, in math specifically in the, the long 80% when you're practicing, yes. um, the steps on how to go about res uh, resolving, you could write them on a piece of papers, mixing them up and ask them to organize it as a practice. And, you know, forcing them, like you're giving them the step, right? And you say, okay, now put them in order that makes sense. And then solve with the step that they put in order and see, does it make sense? So by like kind of, um, uh, reworking with them, like visualizing, naming the steps. Sometimes that helps also. Mm -hmm. And and you could like kind of support in extracting questions, like little reminders to, to for them to trigger these, what they need to do is it's because they're, they're intelligent and they're capable of doing it. It's just, you're helping them getting organized. That's all, which is a challenge. I do recognize. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, let's continue. So now we have to recognize that they have many, many strengths. Like for example, they're excellent employee when they feel confident. Once they know what they have to do, they're the best. They will do it to the letter and doing very, very well. They're, the, they're perseverant, they're authentic, they're curious, they're helpful, they're comfortable with or without supervision. So you could trust them because you know that they'll do what they need to do because they wanna impress, they wanna, they, they want your they want your your approval at the end of the day because you know they want to feel competent like everyone right and and they're incredible keen observers the detail because you know that's what they work on you know uh, so they do have a lot of a lot of strength okay um, in terms of what to do for self help so if I had like for my son this is something. This is something I still work on, even though as a young adult right now, is like, you need to know your needs well. I can assume as a teacher, as a mother, what you need, but you as a student, you need to take the time and to figure out what do I need? You need to know your needs so you could be able to ask for what you need so someone could, could, uh, could help. It's not to be afraid to ask and to be they know, they're aware that, that sometimes they're gonna be judged, that sometimes they're gonna be turned down sometimes, but not to be afraid because they, they're, 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 they're their own advocates, right? And to be kind and patient to yourself, that is a big one. Um, to, de to develop your organization tools, so to figure out this is something you have trouble with, let's see what works for you and you always use it. And of course, using technology to help. Technology is their, their third hand, I call it. They uh, to communicate, to 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 reach out, you know. So that's very very useful, and also uh, 
to speak slowly, to give clear instructions, use few words and insist on keywords and tonality. So that's reinforced. So let's say, for example, if you're a reader in an exam, you may use your tone to emphasize keyword to trigger memory. Uh, allow time for reflection before reformulating instruction or continuing the discussion. So take a minute. Silence is your friend with those students. It's okay for silence. They're okay with silence because silence is giving them a chance to breathe in their head. Avoid asking uh, for the person's attention when they're already busy doing a task. So if, if like, like we said, if, if somebody's talking and expected to be taking note, it's very, very difficult. They can do, well, ideally it should be one task at a time. Either provide them notes and explain or, or give them the time when you say something so you could almost like name it. Listen and then now write. Now, ensuring understanding by asking to rephrase, don't ask the person if they understood. Please, this is a common phrase. Oh, did you understand? And of course the answer is gonna be yes. But did they really understand? <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is something that I'm conscious about. Uh, focus on one task at a time. Attract the person's attention by having eye contact. Make sure that when you want to talk to them, that they're looking at you. And if they're not, because I know some people, they're not comfortable looking in your eyes, but they're, that you know they're aware that they're having, you have their focus. They don't have to look in your eyes 100%. They can look at your forehead, your nose, somewhere, but you know at least you have their attention. So eye contact, ideal, but if not, it's not a must, as long as you know you have their attention. Using pictures, pictogram. Uh, and provide example as reference. It's really, really important that they have something always to go and compare it to. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. I really, really like to thank everyone for being here and sharing this conversation with us. And if you have any questions, you have any suggestion, do you need anything we could help you with? Please, uh, the floor is yours. But, uh, what I've realized is that when I get students from the high school section and they have IEPs or information that we should be dealing with, um, here we're told that we have to start from scratch observing their, their situation. And, um, and uh, it just means that we, you know, delays the whole process again to be able to help them. So I really appreciated the answers for preparing them for exams because sometimes we don't have like, um, I know you know aware Michelin, I teach all subjects except for French second language in all levels. So it makes it difficult to start that whole process of figuring out really where everybody is. So being able to have these identifiers and these tools is gonna to be very helpful. So thank you. You're really, thank, thank you. And Avi can help you too with the um, informatic tools. Technology. Technology tools. Assistive tech and accessibility. That's really my focus. Yeah. My okay. mandate. Okay. So. <laughs> we have another question. Um, my yeah. question is uh, because I'm teaching in an individualized setting, yeah. how do I help them stay on task? Because I can help them get started. Here's what you have to do today. Here's a little example. Can you go on and do some more? And then I'm gone taking care of other students and then, and then it goes off to the moon. So how do we help keep them focused? I could, I could just jump in into something that worked for me mm -hmm. for, a student, for students is a timer. A timer, I say, look, I understand it's difficult, but let's do this. Let's pick a number that works for both of us. So it's an agreement. And let's say if it's 10 minutes, I want to put a timer, you can put your phone as a timer, and yeah. I would like you to focus on that specific question for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, you could take a five minute break, but have some sort of like tool. They need that physical, uh, that they, they don't have concept of time, by the way. 
the, the, the concept of time does not exist with these students. So if you say, well, you have 10 minutes and you just walk out for them 10 minutes, it's like, Ooh, what does that mean? So you need something targeted. You need like, I know with, with Louis, my son, uh, whenever he sits down to do homework, it's, it's painful. It's really painful for me because I have to sit next to him and I can't do anything else. And let's be honest, you can't do that, right? So I had to figure out, I say, you put your phone next to you. I don't want to hear it. So he knows someone, he, he, he's responsible for doing whatever he had to do for that. But there is a reward. There is a time off where he's going to, there's an end to it, you know, to support the, the, the concept of time that he's lacking. I don't know, Karin, if you want to add to it. Yeah, I have. <laughs> it's really, I think I'm a, I have dysphasia in English. I have the word, but... <laughs> <laughs> so let's make explain in French and you're going to translate for me. Go ahead. La, la difficulté, en fait, pour les personnes qui ont une dysphasie, c'est de commencer une, une tâche. Donc, ce que je faisais en contexte individualisé, c'est que les 20 premières minutes, je les laissais commencer, je ne corrigeais pas et je m'assurais que tout le monde savait qu'est-ce qu'il allait avoir à faire pour la période, OK? Donc, je ne répondais à aucune question en corrigeant ou quoi que ce soit, mais je m'assurais que tout le monde comprenait, savait les étapes, avait les outils, puis ensuite de ça, je répondais aux besoins particuliers de chacun des élèves. Puis avec le, 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 le cellulaire, bien, effectivement, je donnais plusieurs pauses. Donc, en fait, une période d'une heure trente, bien, je la coupais en trois, tu sais? Et juste s'étirer, bouger, dire une blague ou quoi que ce soit, féliciter quelqu'un, ben, ça, ça, ça donnait l'espace pour se reconcentrer après. So, what Karine was saying is just simply the first 20 minutes of the, of the classroom. Of the classroom, well, of the session, of the teaching session, mm -hmm. is the 20 minutes just to make sure that everybody is aware of what they have to do, the step they have to follow. They have the tools, getting organized, get, get plan, like the planning, you know, sometimes just to get in the groove. And the, the following 20, like the following after these 20 minutes, then she'll go individually and like look at like uh, correcting, supporting, uh, advising, uh, clarifying uh, specific things that they need. And what she also recommends that usually if you have a period of let's say an hour and a half with them, that to separate it in smaller chunks and tell them like in X amount of time, you will have a break. So to give, uh, to give mental breaks and also during the session to have jokes and to get them to physical, like give them the option to stand up, to sit down, to, to lie down, whatever it is they need to do. Like sometimes just physical comfort also plays a role. So, uh, so that's mainly what uh, Karin just said. Thank you. Can I, can I just add something also is the, the working clock is a really good strategy that I've used with students. And it's, you know, it's super visual. It teaches them how to break down the skills and you can throw in that carrot to get them going, right? So you put 10 minutes and it teaches them the concept of what 10 minutes is. Then you can put the piece of the pie for five minutes. It's like a free time or stretching. So in their brains, they're able to visualize the completion of the task and see the fun little bits and the reward at the end. And when you're starting out with the tool, always make sure that that reward piece of the pie is the biggest piece on the clock, right? And then at the end, you can start shrinking that buddy down at the end. Anyways, mm -hmm. just thought I would share that. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. And, and you reminded me of something that might help Valley. It's also really, really important, the strategy when you come to pretests and exams, because if you already, like, let's say you're, you're practicing during the semester, how long it, they spend on a math problem, the fact that you'll see it shrinking in time, that means they're getting better with it. And, and that's for you is also like a measure of comfort on how they're using the steps and the planification methodology. And you're absolutely right. Something might take, let's say, I don't know, 20 minutes to, res to solve at the beginning, especially, I know, again, I'm biased, math is, seems to be an issue always. So the, the, it might, a problem might take 20 minutes to solve, 
but throughout the semester, you'll notice that 20 minute became like 15, that 20 minute became 10, and they're able to measure it. So this is how you could also see another way of measuring if the getting the step, the getting the planification and how to go about something. And, and you may also say like throw the challenge, can we resolve this in let's say five minutes, let's see if we can do it, you know? And if they don't, that's okay too. Let's see, where did it fall? Where did it go wrong? And go back and, and investigate. But that requires a lot of time and planification on the teacher's side, but it, it's really useful tool, especially if you have someone in mind that, that you know, struggles with that. Thank you, Lisa. That's a great idea because I, I did it. Quick question, Michelin, are we allowed to split final exams? No way. This is, that's why with Karen, when she said that, I said, oh, that's a slippery slope. It's- So we can, we we can split our practice exams, but then we gotta get them ready for the long one. That's right. But the thing is, yeah, we have to be very, very careful. It depends on what we're talking about. If it's local exams, maybe you could have a bit of flexibility. Even that, usually exams are administered in one shot and it sucks. But uh, the only time we could split the exam, if we look at science, is the labs and, and, and the theory. But the theory, we know it's still a two hour, three hour exam, which is super long and super difficult. We cannot split exams when it becomes like a ministerial or end of term exams because the administration of an exam has to be as a whole usually but that doesn't mean you can't train during the semester in chunks like like Karin says and and it's also it will be good to have always a, a timer on everything so you could at least have an idea what you're giving them as extra time is feasible or not. You always have to add a third time more because of the stress and the anxiety that comes with an exam, right? But if you find that the same exercise is taking an hour to do in non-stressful environment, then maybe they're not ready. Or uh, what but other I tell them is, I think if, yeah, I think it, because they're not allowed their phones, but I think I'll make sure they have some type of a timer or a clock where they do yeah. their exam because I usually tell them you know the 20 percent part takes half an hour yeah so you got to make it fit in there don't spend three hours like don't spend the whole time on one five point question yeah. so if yeah. they have a little sheet or something on the wall that says first part yeah. 30 minutes and then you know for for and then you take 20 minutes just to read and highlight the information you need in each task so that way we get those points <laughs> and then yeah. you know yeah. so maybe separate the the exam time in tasks or in in instructions yes, so yes. Uh, i think the so. concept be split then they can split themselves the uh the timing that's yeah. kind of cool <laughs> <And we'll laughs> <do that. laughs> Through the term, well, I think what would be a good idea too is to use consistent language. If you talk about priorities, like priorities of the problem, priorities of the, like what the priority of the class is, okay, this task. And then you could throw, roll that into the exam and okay, what's the priority for the points breakdown and how that works and have the discussion with the students before so it'll help ease the anxiety. Yeah. You know, you know, thank you both for saying that. But the other thing, you could also use the smart board. Use a clock on the smart board or even like breaking down the exam. That's part of the training. Like you, you said, Julie, it works for somebody with dysphagia, excuse me, but it works for everybody in the class. How many students sometimes have difficulty just simply getting organized in general? You know, it, it, it's a good like a lot of our students don't know how to study. They don't know how to get organized. They don't know how to plan. So what, when you're helping one student who's struggling, you're helping everyone in the class, right? It, it, it's a life skill. <laughs> so yes, I agree with you, Shudi. I, would, I, I, used to put, I used to put a super clock on my smart board and I used to verbally say 10 minutes. Well, I know it would stress some people, but it would have specifically like a little thing with that student by coming and tapping their desk or their shoulder saying, it's half an hour, now move on, you know, or something, there's some sort of cue, you know, 
but you, they need those cues. And I agree with you, training them on how to take an exam is as important as taking the exam. Yes. Uh, yes, Denise. Just, I was on another training where they were talking about time and how when you have the clocks that, that disappear, that creates anxiety in a lot. So for older students, what you can do is it was just you, all the classrooms like have the, the, the clock with the, the plastic on it and you use dry erase markers. So if you wanted to break down, you could say half an hour for the word problems and you draw your line down the clock and then 15 minute for multiple choice. But as time ticks, it doesn't disappear from view. So it's like, oh, I've just gone over and I should maybe, so it still shows, but it doesn't disappear, which causes anxiety in some people. And then all the classrooms have a clock. So you can just, then you dry, brace it off and start smart. again. That's super smart. Thank you. Very, it's, yeah. it's very clever. Yeah. Now I used to put the digital one on my board. It wasn't like a tick, 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 tick. It would, it would drive me crazy personally. Like uh, I, I just like numbers, <laughs> but what I would put is on the board next on the whiteboard, like, okay. And from this time to this time, this part this time to this time this part this time to this time but the clock was digital was just numbers but uh, this is even a better idea thank you thank you denise because uh, you're right time is a bit of a tricky thing it might create anxiety for some and it might be useful for others so it's a bit of a tricky slippery road but i think i think the idea of having it drawn directly on the clock might not be a bad idea so it's up to them to look up and see it that's actually smart and i love the idea with the pie because they've used it in the class so they could see visually support yeah. so does that help julie yes thank you very much i'm going to implement a ton of things already <laughs> And please let's, let us know how it goes because it's always nice to get feedback. It's always nice to know what works, what doesn't work and how we can kind of improve it. And uh, if it, maybe we won't have you over, but uh, if I can steal your PowerPoint and, and show everyone at school, uh, I'll steal everything you said and, and share the love. <laughs> uh, more love to give, go ahead. It's the whole purpose is to create awareness. And the more people that knows, the better our students will be successful, the more thankful uh, we all are because uh, it's our kids at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Our kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful afternoon. Thank you.